Good morning, everyone. We welcome you this morning to our worship service for Sunday, May the 3rd. And uh, we really believe that we would be able to be back together by now to return to our church home, our beautiful facility here, and begin public worship again. But uh, as you all know, uh, that is not the case. We're still uh, hoping that uh, circumstances in our uh, state and, and country are going to improve and that we'll soon be back together again. And as we've stated before, um, we really miss being here and I really miss you all. But um, God uh, wonderfully has provided for us a means of communication uh, beyond just being in uh, the personal presence with everyone uh, through the electronic media, uh, the internet, uh, it's a, a wonderful media, and I thank the Lord for that. It's not the same as being together in worship service, uh, but I'm thankful at least uh, that we can communicate God's word of, of encouragement and hope and salvation uh, to all of our members and even beyond our membership. Uh, we have received uh, lots of views uh, from all across the country of people who have uh, watched our videos, listened to our sermons, and who knows uh, what wonderful benefits will come uh, from this effort. And uh, it may be something that we'll want to continue even once we begin to uh, gather together uh, back in our, uh, in our churches, and uh, that may be so. I ask for your prayers as I'm praying for all of you. I uh, hope and pray that you're all safe, uh, that, um, uh, that everything is well with you, and again, we look forward to being together again real soon. I want to read uh, some scriptures here. I think uh, probably one of the most familiar um, uh, New Testament stories uh, in, in, all the, in all the Bible. From John chapter 3. And of course, you've heard me say this. Many of you have. Uh, John chapter 3 verse 16 is likely one of the most familiar uh, if not the most familiar verse of Scripture in all of the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And what a wonderful, wonderful message uh, of hope that is to uh, fallen humanity, a lost world. And thank the Lord through Jesus Christ our Savior, God's only begotten Son. He gave his life on Calvary's cross that we might have the hope of eternal life. This is the story leading up to uh, those wonderful words of hope uh, given to Nicodemus and also to his generation, but for all generations to come. And uh, I, I certainly hope and pray uh, that everyone that will hear this message, uh, everyone that would hear this wonderful verse of Scripture would take it to heart and realize that our hope lies in Jesus Christ. John writes here in John chapter 3, verse 1, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, 
and ye receive not our witness. And I'm going to stop reading there at verse 11. My thought for today, the title for my message today, is A World Upside Down. A World Upside Down. You know, in the time that we're living in, uh, there's certainly lots of reasons for our concern. Uh, we're seeing things today that none of us have ever uh, imagined that we would see in our lifetime. I've spoken to many of you, and nearly everyone that I speak to said, you know, this is just something that uh, we just never would have imagined. And uh, so we're going through a very difficult time right now, and it almost seems like our world has been turned upside down. And uh, that's going to be the, the thought for my message today, a world upside down. Many years ago, uh, I don't remember how many years ago, I received uh, in the mail a little publication and it's titled uh, Ultimate Questions. Ultimate Questions. This is a book by John Blanchard. He is a, a minister, uh, lives in England. Uh, he is a pastor. He is a theologian, uh, an apologist, uh, someone uh, who's dedicated his life uh, defending uh, God's word of truth. Uh, and and uh, uh, apologetics is a, uh, a course of study that is uh, really what we believe and why we believe it. And uh, in this little booklet, I've had this for years, I've, I've used this uh, wonderful title even for a, a sermon title in uh, years past, Ultimate Questions. And you know, we all have, have questions about many, many things. And this little booklet deals with uh, questions uh, John Blanchard considered to be some of the most important or most significant questions that men will ever ask in their life. Is there a God? Uh, you know, we, we, we study about and, and, and we think about that question. Is there a God? And it's a tremendous debate even in our time. People want to know where do we come from? How did we get here? You know, and what is our purpose here? And of course, in God's Word, um, we're given lots of questions similar to that. In the Old Testament, uh, Job asked one of the most uh, serious questions, I think, that anyone would ever consider. If a man dies, shall he live again? In other words, is there anything after this life? It, when we die, is there anything beyond this life? And then, of course, in the New Testament, uh, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas, what must I do in order to be saved? And so God's Word deals with those uh, questions, ultimate questions, significant questions. And uh, today we're going to talk about some of those questions. Uh, I'm standing here. Uh, I want to thank uh, uh, Teresa Carter. She uh, uh, brings flowers in and, and different uh, decorations for our uh, communion table week after week. And it's always a wonderful blessing to see what she's going to have for us. And of course, she's brought in these old uh, styled lamps uh, with the candles in them. Here's an old fashioned lantern, uh, different types of lights that have been used in, in ages past. And I brought in this morning uh, a menorah. I purchased this menorah when I was in Israel many years ago. Uh, I bought it in Jerusalem, and it was just uh, something that caught my attention, and, uh, and, and, and I bought it, and I've had it for a number of years. And uh, it also was a source of light for the tabernacle. Uh, the, the priest would go in and light these candles to give light within the, the tabernacle. And, of course, light is a very... Uh, <laughs> I important uh, thing in, in our life. In fact, the matter is, the very first command in God's Word, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, God said, let there be light, and immediately there was light. Praise the Lord. Uh, God intended for there to be light in this world that we're living in. Well, in, in thinking about questions, you know, light is um, metaphorically synonymous with understanding. You know, we want something to shed light on a particular subject that we might be able to understand. And uh, in thinking about some of the most important questions that we would ever consider, for example, where do we come from? Is there a source that we can turn to that will give light or shed light on that particular subject? What are we doing here? What is our purpose? And, of course, the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? Do we have a source of answers for those particular questions? You know, in Psalm 119, 
That is the largest chapter in all of the Bible. It comes from the largest book in all of the Bible, the book of Psalms. And Psalm 119 verse 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. And again, that is a, 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 just an, an illustration of God giving us light or a sense of direction for our, for our life. And of course, if we study God's Word, I, I believe we find the answers to some of life's most difficult questions that we'll ever encounter uh, in our particular time. Well, Nicodemus uh, came to Jesus by night, and, and most of us may be familiar with the story. And uh, Nicodemus was uh, a man lived, who lived in turbulent times, uh, similar to what we're living in, in now. We're living in very troubled times, and certainly the time that Nicodemus lived in. It was a very turbulent time. And uh, I'm satisfied that Nicodemus, what we know about him is that he was a very devout religious man. He was a Pharisee. Uh, he was uh, perhaps a member of the Sanhedrin, that Jewish uh, council, the uh, religious council. And these men uh, were highly uh, honored and, and looked up to for their knowledge and their understanding. Nicodemus, Jesus referred to him as a master or a teacher. And it's very likely that Nicodemus might have had a doctor of divinity of degree, what we would call that today. He was a doctor of the law. Uh, but any, uh, he was very educated in God's word. And I believe Nicodemus was very satisfied and very comfortable with where he was at uh, in, in his, his life. He would have been a man who was looked up to by his generation. He was a man of accomplishment uh, and, 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 of course, a, a very devout religious man and most likely satisfied with where he was until the day when Jesus entered into his life and Nicodemus' world was turned upside down. And brothers and sisters, this is a message for uh, Christianity today. It, it, it's a message for all of us who believe and, and, and trust in the Lord. It is also a message for those who are, uh, who are not believers, who are not saved, who are not yet prepared to meet God. And, and to you that are saved, Nicodemus, if he was living in our time, uh, we would look at his life and think there is a Christian man. There is a God-fearing, God-believing man. And certainly he was. But when he came across Jesus, or when Jesus and he crossed paths in this world, everything changed for, for Nicodemus. In fact, his world was turned upside down. If I could use a more uh, a, a recent expression, I believe we could say safely that Jesus rocked his world. Um, Nicodemus was religiously educated. Uh, if you talk to him about God's inspired word, he could have answered all the, all the difficult questions. He could have expounded on the, the laws of Moses and, and even uh, related many of the stories and, and, and the prophecies by the Old Testament prophets. prophets. But he, he was devoutly religious and well knowledgeable in God's word. But when he came to Jesus, there was an uncertainty in him. He said, Master, we know thou art a teacher come from God because no man can do the things that thou doest except God be with him. And the Lord told Nicodemus, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. And, and, and of course, Nicodemus didn't understand what he was talking about. And, and folks, I believe there's a lot of people in our time uh, that would be in the same condition that Nicodemus was in here. Religiously educated, devoutly religious, maybe diligent, maybe members of a church, uh, devoted to go to church on a, on a regular basis, wouldn't think of missing a service, and yet they might just be just as ignorant about God's word as Nicodemus uh, was here in this particular story. And of course, it was in this story where the Lord told Nicodemus, you, you've got to be born again. In fact, of the matter, until you are born again, or unless you are born again, you can't see or you can't begin to comprehend the kingdom of God. And we can see the, 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 the perplexion or the frustration in Nicodemus when he said, how can these things be? And yet Jesus referred to him as being a master in Israel, a teacher uh, of religious um, matters in his time. You know, folks, as we read through the, the New Testament, 
Uh, we get a picture of the, the religious um, uh, circumstances in, in their time. Nicodemus was a Pharisee. The Pharisees seemed to be one of the dominant uh, forms of religion among Judaism of that particular time. And, and there were many uh, people in, in that time who were following in that faith. Uh, Saul of Tarsus, he was another man that was a Pharisee, religiously educated. He said that he was educated by Gamaliel, uh, a well-respected teacher in his time. Saul of Tarsus referred to himself as a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And I, and I believe probably Saul of Tarsus would have, would have considered himself to be a Pharisee among the Pharisees. He was devoutly educated in the law. He knew a lot about God. Paul was devout in his faith and, and he thought what he was doing for, for God, what he was doing was he was doing for God. But he learned in that experience on the road to Damascus uh, that, that he was wrong, that he was absolutely wrong. And of course, he was gloriously and wonderfully saved and his life was changed and, and, and the Lord changed his name from Saul to Paul. And he went on to become one of the greatest preachers of all time, the greatest missionaries of all time, wrote most of the New Testament. Nicodemus and Saul of Tarsus, they had much in common. They had uh, much the same experience. And uh, of course, um, Jesus changed their life. And I want to tell you, you know, when I was 10 years old, I was raised in church. Uh, my mom and dad took me to church from the time I was just a little boy. I was raised in church. I was taught about God and I loved to go to church. And I've shared this with people all through my ministry that children love to go to church. I was just like that. But one day Jesus rocked my world when my conscience was, was, was opened and I understood that I was a sinner in need of, uh, of God's saving grace. And from the time that I was 10 years old, uh, about for the next eight or nine years, I was diligently seeking the Lord and ultimately I was saved. And the Lord, when, when I became convicted of my sins, the Lord turned my world upside down. Now, it's interesting in uh, this, uh, the, the book of Acts, uh, I believe it's uh, recorded there when Paul and, and Silas went to Thessalonica. Uh, the Christians in that time, they were accused of turning the world upside down. Uh, and, and, and the people of their, their day, the Pharisees, the people in Jesus' day, uh, they looked at Jesus, they looked at his disciples as turning this world upside down with this new doctrine, with this new uh, preaching and with the, the miracles and the wonderful things that were being done. They looked at them as, as, as turning the world upside down. But an interesting perspective here in the book of Ecclesiastes Solomon said this in the seventh chapter of the book of Ecclesiastes. He said, I gave my heart to seek and to search out everything that is done under the sun. In fact, Solomon in the third chapter of Ecclesiastes, he said, God has put the world in men's hearts. He's put eternity in men's hearts. And Solomon said that he gave his heart to seek and search out everything that was done under the sun. In other words, he wanted to understand everything about this world. And he came to the conclusion, he said, this is what I found. He said, searching diligently and looking, he said, this is what I found. He said, God made man upright, but he has sought out many inventions. Now, if we understand this correctly, what Solomon was saying is God made man upright. But that man in his, in his own way and in his own life has sought out many inventions or many ways of corrupting themselves and, and causing this, this world that God made upright to be turned upside down. And it's interesting in the book of Genesis. Uh, in, the, in the third chapter of the book of Genesis, we find the very first question. Now, in the first chapter of Genesis, the very first commandment, God said, let there be light. And God intended for this world to have light, this beautiful, magnificent light. We, we love it when we see the sun. But you know, God wanted the world to, to, to have this kind of light, but he also wanted the world to have another kind of light that we know as understanding. And when we understand God's word, we begin to understand and find answers to all those ultimate questions that we all deal with in our own time. Well, the very, very first question 
that is recorded in the Bible is in the third chapter of the book of Genesis and the very first verse where Satan, the devil, has, has said to Eve, Yea, hath God said. And uh, if we were to reword that in, in, in words that we would use today, what Satan was implying, what he was asking is, did God really say that? God gave Adam a commandment in the beginning not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Satan, the, the serpent, came along and, and he raised this question in Eve's mind. Did God really say that? And folks, we're still wrestling with that question today. Men look at the Bible. Men hear words quoted from this marvelous book. And they'll ask the question, is that really what God said? Or is that really what God means? And, and folks, I want to tell you, you know, this is God's inspired word that he has given to us. It is a book filled with knowledge and it gives understanding and, and wisdom to people who will search its wonderful pages and read the words that are recorded in this. In fact, the matter is God's word will give us life uh, if we'll pay attention to it and heed what God's word has to say. Now, Nicodemus was comfortable in his time as a, as a religious Pharisee. He was, he, he, was, he was religious. He was comfortable. He was satisfied until Jesus Christ came along and he saw something in Jesus that he did not see in himself or anybody else in, in his time as well. And you know, it's really a whole lot like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. When they sinned against God, when they began to question God's word, the devil planted the seed with this question. Did God really say that? Is that what God meant? Uh, he said, you shall not surely die. He lied to them. And as they began to ponder this, this thought and, and, and wrestle with this question, they sinned against God. They transgressed the commandment. And immediately they recognized that they were both naked and they sewed fig leaves together. I don't know how long they, they lived in, in, in that uh, condition with the fig leaves. I doubt that it was very long. But as they clothed themselves in fig leaves, perhaps they were immediately satisfied with that covering for their nakedness. But when God came on the scene, they ran and hid themselves among the trees of the garden because they were not comfortable in God's presence in that condition. God made another kind of, uh, of covering for their nakedness. Animals were slain. Their skins were taken and made coats for their physical nakedness. And God gave them a promise that he was going to send a savior that would take care of this, th their sin nature. And praise the Lord, God loved Adam and Eve so much. God loved their offspring so much. God loved this whole world and all of the human offspring in it so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe and trust in his name would be saved gloriously and wonderfully saved and given new life. Nicodemus was perplexed by the Lord's uh, response to, to his coming to him. But when Nicodemus encountered the Lord, he realized something was missing in his life. And I'm telling you, whenever you come into the presence of the Lord, you'll realize that there's something wrong, that there's something missing in your life. And what we need, what every one of us needs is just what the Lord told Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must have this experience, this life changing experience. Now, when Jesus, when, when Nicodemus first encountered Jesus, his life changed. He was no longer comfortable as, as Nicodemus, the Pharisee. Something was missing and he realized that and he came to the Lord. But the evidence in John's gospel later on demonstrates that Nicodemus experienced another change. He stood in defense of Jesus before the Sanhedrin. He was there with Joseph of Arimathea when he was buried, helped Joseph prepare the body for Jesus' burial. I believe Nicodemus experienced that new birth. And folks, as I began to consider God's word in my life and, and who I was and where I was in, in my time, I understood that I was lost. I was in need of God's saving grace, his forgiveness, and praise the Lord. When I was 19 years old, the Lord saved my soul. Now, in the time that we're living in, our world has been changed. Our world has been rocked by this coronavirus. It's a change that none of us like. 
None of us imagined that, it, that anything like this would ever happen in our time. But it, it's causing all of us to, to wonder and, and think, uh, is God telling us something? Is God doing something in, in our life? And, and it's causing us to look to God's word and, and, and to try to understand, are these signs pointing to the Lord's coming? I believe God, as I mentioned in my message last week, God is giving us signs telling us that we need to be ready. We need to be prepared to meet God. And folks, I wonder today, I really wonder today if, if, if Christianity isn't perhaps in, in a similar condition as Nicodemus was in his time, as Judaism was in its time, the Pharisees were in its time. I wonder how the Lord looks at, at us. You know, we, we've been uh, comfortable coming to our, our beautiful church houses and, and sitting on our pews and, and singing our songs and listening to sermons and going home, um, perhaps, you know, uh, feeling blessed and thinking that we've done the will of God, but the coronavirus has changed all of that. We've not been able to meet here in, in, in several weeks. We've had to, had to try to meet this way, and we're, we're hungry. We're, we're, we're wanting to hear a message from God, a message from God's Word, and this, is, this is, has pushed us out of our comfort zone into a, a, a new forum, a new media of trying to get God's Word out uh, to people who desperately need to hear what thus saith the Lord. Now, the Pharisees, they were comfortable with their religion, uh, the, the Sadducees, they were comfortable with their religion and Jesus came along and rocked their world and turned their world upside down. People would later be called Christians because uh, they, they were hearing the commandments of the Lord. They were living their lives according to Jesus' teaching, so much so that they were branded by people uh, unbelievers as being Christians, as being Christ-like. And here in Thessalonica, they were, uh, they were blamed for turning the world upside down. Well, perhaps, folks, in a very real way, God has turned our world upside down through this horrible event that we're experiencing in our time. We've been satisfied. We've been comfortable with who we are and where we are religiously in our time. This is causing us to rethink uh, where we are and, and, and what we're about. And, and folks, this world is, is hungry and, and desperate to hear a message from God's Word. In the third chapter of, of Revelation, um, John the Revelator, John the Apostle was, was challenged by the Lord uh, to write letters to the seven churches of Asia. And in the third chapter of the Gospel of John, the very last letter in, those, uh, in, in that series of letters, a letter was written to the church at Laodicea. And the Lord described the church at Laodicea, the people there, they were, they were rich. They considered themselves to be rich. And they considered themselves not to be in need of anything. But the Lord uh, condemned them as being poor and blind and, and, and miserable and, and naked. And this was a church. This was a group of people that uh, uh, would, would be referred to as a, a Christian church. They were comfortable. They were satisfied. But the Lord challenged them to repent, you know, and, 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 and turn to God. And I feel like in our time today, perhaps that's the message that God is sending to the, the Christian world in, in our time. Uh, that we've grown too comfortable, that we've grown too complacent with the way things are. When the world around us, you know, is in sin and is in darkness, is in need of this glorious, wonderful message that Jesus Christ gave to Nicodemus. He told Nicodemus, I didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved. And he tells us there that God loves this world so much. He doesn't want any to perish, but that all should come to repentance and, and be saved. That everyone who would believe and trust in the Lord would be saved by His marvelous grace. A world upside down. God, when He made the world in the beginning, He made everything good and, and clean and pure and perfect and holy. And Adam and Eve were made and they were put in this perfect world. Satan comes along and he raises the question, did God really say that? 
And Adam and Eve sinned against God and it turned the world upside down. Solomon, in his, in his diligent search uh, of the world and everything that he could understand about it, he said, this is what I found, that God made man upright, but he's corrupted himself. Jesus Christ came along to, up, to, to set aright this world that was upside down. God made it upright in the beginning. Sin corrupted the world and turned it upside down. Christ came and Christ sent his church into the world to preach the gospel, to set things aright. Brothers and sisters of faith, that's what we're here for, is to help in this glorious ministry of setting this world that is upside down, of setting it aright. If you've been saved by the grace of God, you've got the most wonderful good news that anybody in the world could have, that Jesus Christ is Lord, and that he is Savior of lost humanity, and that anyone who would believe and trust in the Lord could know, could know, beyond the shadow of the doubt, would know with absolute certainty that I'm saved by the grace of God. Jesus rocked my world. I was just 10 years old, and he rocked my world. Everything turned upside down for me, and I was troubled. But I began to seek after the Lord, and when I was 19 years old, by the grace of God, he enabled me to trust in him, and he saved my soul. And just like David in the Old Testament, David said the Lord brought him out of a horrible pit and set him on a rock, set him on a solid foundation and established his goings, gave him new direction for his life. I believe in David's own expression. David was saying that his world was turned upside down, uh, but the Lord turned it right side up. Praise the Lord. And David said, the Lord put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. And many will see it, he said. Many will, many will see his life. Many will observe the, the wonderful change in his life and give praise to God. And that's what God wants from us who are saved by his marvelous grace. I believe that's what Nicodemus experienced in his time. God wanted the world to have light. And God has provided wonderful light. He's provided wonderful answers for us through his word. God bless you is my prayer. Uh, Jesus said, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they are they that testify of me. And they are truly, truly words that testify of the amazing saving grace of God. I want to pray for you, church. I'm praying that the Lord will keep you strong and safe and, and healthy. Let's all be looking to the Lord, trusting in Him, searching His Word, living and, and, and serving God in, in the best way that we can and sharing the good news with everyone that, that's around us. God is in control. He's able to save our sins. He's able to forgive us our sins and give us eternal life. And to you that don't know the Lord, if you're lacking this peace, if you're lacking the assurance uh, of where you're going to spend eternity, I, uh, I appeal to you, put your faith and trust in the Lord. Uh, make a place, find a place where you can get to by yourself and call on the Lord and ask Him to save your soul. He'll hear and answer that prayer of faith. He'll give you peace in your heart. He'll give you assurance, absolute assurance that you've been saved by His marvelous grace. Holy Father, God, we thank you for the wonderful light that you have given to us. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes, it's a wonderful thing to behold the light of the sun. And uh, Lord, it, it, it certainly is. We love to see the sun shine. But Lord, we, we desire, we, we hunger and long to see uh, the glory of your son, Jesus Christ, who came into this world to be a light in the world and to give us hope and peace and assurance of eternal life. We thank you, Lord, for your unspeakable gift. 
We thank you, Jesus, Lord, for your amazing sacrifice. We thank you for your unconditional love that we could have this peace and this assurance of eternal life. Bless your people, Lord, as they struggle through these uncertain times. Our world has been shaken, Lord, and, and, and turned upside down by this, this terrible disease. But God, we thank you for your saving grace, for the hope that we have in you. Guide us and use us for your glory. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you is my prayer.